So uh, it's eight o'clock. Uh, why don't we get started? I'm uh, Arlen Myers. Uh, I'm with the uh, MI10 and the Society of Physician Entrepreneurs, and my colleague uh, Anthony Chang and uh, Harvey Castro is joining us, amongst others. So Anthony, let's say hi. Yeah, hi everyone. And maybe Arlen, you can maybe you can introduce Eric as well as a partner. Yeah, Eric, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, certainly, Eric Wickland, uh, Senior Editor for Technology and Innovation at Health Leaders. Thanks for joining us. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that that site or that platform? Uh, we are a C-suite focused uh, uh, site. We've got a number of of websites focused on different C-suite executives within the healthcare system. We also have a number of events called exchanges where we bring uh, executives together to talk about the biggest issues in healthcare, um, and this will cover events, uh, the big uh -huh. events in healthcare. Right. It, it might be useful for you to put a link or something in the chat, so if folks want to learn more about it, they can. Certainly. Okay, great. So um, before before we get started, uh, uh, if anyone has uh, questions or issues or things they're trying to solve or problems they run into or any of that stuff, why don't you put it in the chat, raise your hand, and uh, we can sort of address it or compare notes, see whether anybody can uh, help each other. Um, thanks, Eric. So uh, I thought what we would do today is um, discuss uh, uh, AI maturity models mm -hmm. and um, at, and compare and some other issues to compare them with AI readiness. So the basic idea is if you're getting started as, or not getting started, if you're at a certain level, how do you know where you are and all the is and issues associated with that? And, and then where do you want to go and how do you want to get there? So Anthony, do you want to, uh, you've, You've created something with MI10 called the MIQ. So we've kicked this back and forth and done some background on it. So maybe you can sort of explain what we're talking about. Sure. Um, I, everyone here may or may not be familiar with a few AI maturity models that kind of um, gives you an idea where your organization is in terms of your AI activities. And I, I think it's it's a little bit more complicated than that. I think, um, um, you know, I think in particularly in the U.S., we tend to have a very uh, like a fast food approach to everything. We want a quick assessment and then a score. <laughs> we we're just obsessed with scores. Um, I I think, you know, I'm someone that actually practices AI in the hospital, so I. And when you look at some of the scores by particularly some of the consulting companies, I see the people that write this up, they aren't even practicing clinicians or work actively in a hospital. So I think it's kind of like trying to figure out a strategy when you're not really actively involved. I think it's a different perspective. So my take on this is that it's good to assess yourself and just get a snapshot of where the organization is. So I call that uh, a AI readiness rather than AI maturity. I think you have to be ready first. Um, you can't just jump into maturity. So that's my personal um, aspect, uh, personal perception that that you need to figure out where you are. And then based on the AI readiness, and then you execute AI projects so I, I look at this as a two-step process, the AI readiness, and then you measure your AI uh, execution rather than a single AI maturity model, which three or four, I think, consulting firms are, are, are writing up. I think it's just lack of full understanding of how tough this is. Um, if your organization is not AI ready, then it's premature to have an AI maturity model because you don't have the pieces in place. Um, so I, I think it's really important to have an AI readiness assessment. And then the hard part is the execution. So uh, I've uh, with, with our team at MI10, we've been able to score about a dozen hospitals and the range from zero to hundred, I kept it simple, 
the range is is like 26 to 88. So the range is really wide of hospitals in terms of whether or not they're ready for AI activities. And the brand of the hospital has no correlation to how ready they are. So um, that's the other surprise. Just because you're a big name organization, that doesn't mean that you're AI ready. Um, so the range is pretty wide in terms of AI readiness. And then I think that's the beginning. That's that's a snapshot of your organization. And then execution of AI projects is also not entirely correlated to your AI readiness score. So the, the hospitals that are AI ready at a pretty high level have not demonstrated to me anyway that they're really well equipped to execute the AI project. So that's a second kind of assessment altogether. So this is a lot like building a building. I mean, you have to have like a foundation and that's sort of the readiness part. And then you need like a plan, like a blueprint, like how are we gonna get there? And then you gotta build a building, which is in the execution part. And hopefully it's you know on time and under budget. Is that is that your view? Yeah, yeah I think that's one way we can look at it. The other way to look at it, if you wanna look at a sports analogy is you know, putting together a team of good players and good coaches, that's the readiness part. Now, how you execute and do during the season is totally, totally different. As we know that you can have a great team and great coaches and be a 500 team, right? So it really is that. So that's why I think AI maturity doesn't really work in the healthcare system. It works in other sectors, but healthcare is pretty complicated just because you have a great team doesn't guarantee that you can get this done because the getting it done is is a whole new list of challenges um, that, right. that you have to overcome. Okay, so um, th- as you know, and as others may know, that there's a lot of different ways to skin this cat. So let's just go back to the readiness part. Like, what do you measure? Like, what are the components or the criteria or the you know, the metrics or the rubrics for whether you are essentially ready to do this? And and how does MI10s or your take on this differ from other models? Yeah, I break it down to uh, 11 different sectors. So the score is zero to 100 to keep it simple. Four sectors is dependent on your technological uh, aspects, Four is on the human aspects, because that's important in, in the AI team or AI uh, readiness. Two are both, and one is the intangibles. So um, so I kind of have this zero to 100 point system for AI readiness. And as I said, the median of the 12, 13 hospitals that we've assessed was right around 56. So right in the middle, um, I call that um, AI ready, but not quite enabled. Uh, and then there are a few hospitals. No one's in the bottom category, which is AI um, AI nascent. Um, they're uh, AI aware is this second from the bottom, and the the lowest hospitals are you know twenty six to thirty range. So they're AI aware. They're they're kind of um, and that's what I mean is they know what's happening in healthcare. They just haven't gotten themselves organized, but it wouldn't take much for them to go to the middle tier. Um, so uh, that's AI ready. So, um, but very few hospitals are what I call AI enabled, which is the the top category uh, that they actually have all the pieces in place to actually execute. Yeah. So there. Hey, so I so I put the. You, can you see that? Anthony, can you see that on the screen? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, so this is, so now that I put this up here, maybe you can just sort of amplify what you just so, said. So on the right is how the hospitals have fared in terms of their assessment, their AI readiness. And then on the left is a spider diagram of a typical spider diagram showing what areas they need to work on. So there are three big sectors. Again, the technology, the business or the people part, and then combined. So this hospital, for example, really needs to work on um, the ability to implement projects as well as their team dynamic. Whereas the 
technological and the human aspects are pretty strong. So that's a, so we, I like to kind of show the hospitals, you know, what, which of the three sectors do they need to work on to be uh, ready for uh, AI execution? Okay, so I'll leave this up for a while. So people in the group, uh, what are your comments or issues or what do you see a problem with this or what, what's your feedback on what you see? Uh, Harvey, you want to, or Eric, you want to mention anything or? Yeah, I, I what came to mind and I was literally just going to ask ChatGPT to compare it. Um, I'm curious to see how this compares to Tesla's autonomous driving, you know, from level, I think it's one to five and then five being totally independent um, uh, because that's the concept, you know, you're going from nothing to something. Stage one would be someone not not driving at all or not knowing and not, not trusting the, or driving itself, rather the person, the human being to all the way to the end. I agree with the assessment in that if you're not aware of what's going on, you, I mean, of like get a true assessment from your team, how could you know where to start? Um, and then are you ready for AI? And then what parts are you focused? And then once you're there, what part of implementation and are you, you know, are you one of the leaders now of the pack? So it's, it's I like the diagram and, and I love your spider diagram to kind of show the different uh, multi factors to, to all of these stages. So good job guys. Uh, what are your, what are your concerns? Like, if you do one thing to make it better, what would you do? I think um, I would have more assessment on the on the education for stage one because you don't know what you don't know. So if someone at a hospital administrator could see the different things that play into stage one and two to to really identify, I think that would be a key factor um, to understand what the problem is. Because again, if you don't know what you don't know, if you could show Hospital X is uh, using AI, and these are the factors that are causing them to be a leader. And and where you are in comparison, that that would create somewhat FOMO. And on top of that, want to start going towards that that end line and end goal. Eric, in your uh, in your world, how how much is this top of mind for hospital executives? I think you know they don't, as Harvey says. The biggest hangup right now is getting started. I mean, the, the, some of the bigger health systems are partnering with Microsoft and, and, and Google and some of the others because they really don't know what they have a, or how to get going. Uh, they're trusting some of the leaders in the industry to, to get to push them in the right direction. But yeah, how does a health system understand or how does the health system understand where it needs to go to begin this process? Okay, and to that point, um, I put up another article that recently appeared in the chat. I think you can see it in the chat on the, in the Harvard Business Review. And it, it, this is just one of many articles that have to do with basically how do you get started and, and what is the infrastructure stuff that we're talking about. This particular one had, was under the title of how do you democratize data? And so this has to do with, again, the infrastructure and getting started and um, readiness level. And they mentioned five pillars um, and you could agree or disagree with them, but basically what they said was, um, so one is broaden data access by, and we can just discuss these individually, uh, data access by rolling out data catalogs and marketplaces. So in other words, how do you eliminate data silos in the organization so that everybody kind of has access to stuff? Um, and, and Anthony, you you want to respond to that because you're dealing with 100 centers of excellence dealing with this. So, so what are they doing or what advice can you give or what works and what doesn't? Yeah, um, um actually not surprised to find out um, that even though you're a center that's pretty well advanced in your AI efforts with the team and everything, like I was saying before, um, the single most glaring deficiency I find in all of these centers, most of these centers, 
is some data governance, some data roadmap, some data strategy, um, including my own hospital, by the way, we're working hard on it. You know, a lot of time, and what, what this reflects, Arlen, is that for decades, we've been going at it to have data in a hospital, but we really haven't paid attention to, until now, attention to a data governance in terms of where data reside, where da how data should be organized, and who's keeping the data, and who has oversight. All of those questions really haven't been um, important enough to pay attention to because we haven't had a resource like you know, artificial intelligence uh, until now. So you could get away with not have paying attention to these things. Uh, but once you start thinking about doing AI projects, you know, you really need to get your foundational layer of data really much better organized and much better uh, sort of structured so that you can actually work with this. And typical examples are, you know, we have um, some hospitals will have task forces dealing with problems. And then it's not unusual, for instance, let's say there's a quality improvement you know, team working on uh, central line infections. It's not unusual that you'll have five to 10 different sources of data and no, including data, data um, sources that no one knew about <laughs> because it's sequestered with somebody. And now, you know, all of a sudden people realize that you have to make it cohesive and get it, you know, organized. So I think it's a good process. It's, you know, sort of like cleaning house. You have to kind of get it ready before you have AI. I always say AI is like the special dinner guest. You know, you kind of have to get your house in order first and in order to have that dinner guest. And AI, I think, is a nice force, not just a resource, but it's a nice force to inspire everyone to get the data organized and that's what's happening in my hospital we're very excited about finally something that people want to do anyway arlen <laughs> we just haven't had a, a real uh sort of um uh inspirational uh opportunity to do this and now you know people are excited that we're going to have a roadmap for the entire hospital we're going to have overlay on top of the basic organ data organizational map we're going to have for each project you know, like an overlay of additional data sources that can be uh, included into the uh, data science aspect. So in your travels, have you identified folks that are getting this right? Or, or are there any recent examples or, or places you're working with that seem to be in the right direction? Of course, obviously, other than your hospital, but other places that seem to be no, getting we this right. I'd be the first to admit, Arlen, that we haven't, we don't have it right right now, but we're on our way. And I don't know of a hospital when the directors or the AI leaders are really being honest with me that has it totally organized. I, I think we'll be there within a few years. You'll, you'll have, you know, role model health systems that really have, you know, this figured out. But it's it's right now, I don't see any organization. And, and you know what? Organizations are willing to admit that they need to work on this. So uh, I think it's all coming down to data. Conversely, okay. is there an example out there of someone that's really doing it wrong? I I do, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> but we're being recorded. So we're being so. recorded, so yeah. but, and and they're my amongst my closest friends out there. But <laughs> um, but I I think everyone realizes that how brittle your AI projects are going to be unless you get this foundation of a uh, of data right. And I think everyone realizes that now. It's just really, really, it's one thing to get your AI project off into a publication. When you implement, that's when the instability of your foundation is going to be very obvious. Uh, Harvey, thanks for your stuff in the chat. So AJ, do you want to introduce yourself and ask your question? Hi, uh, this is Ajay Tripuneni. I'm a physician with uh, Baylor Scott and White. Can mm -hmm. you hear me? I'm in a choppy Wi-Fi connection. Yeah, at we the can hospital. Hear yeah, we can hear you. We can't see you, but we can hear you. Why don't you give us your question? Yeah, so I'm trying to focus on a startup on disease healthcare platform 
but also do a validation study that I got an internal grant. So how do we navigate uh, three or four layers? Like legally, how do you coordinate with the hospitals? We're still trying to get their foundational uh, models for data and everything correct. The second question is, if you do need data and you need integration with electronic medical records, there seems to be barriers set up by uh, Epic and I don't know much about Cerner, Epic certainly. How do you navigate those barriers? Right, so those are all good questions. Um, and maybe Anthony, you can uh, address it. I I'll just take a brief shot at it. I mean, there there's a couple of questions in that question. And, and forgive me if, let me just rephrase because I think I know what you're asking, but let me be sure. So you're a startup that is a, basically a digital health AI something startup, and you're trying to either pilot or integrate your solution into a customer, in this case happens to be a hospital, that has an electronic medical record system, most likely with Epic, Cerner, uh, health, the tech, whatever, is, is that, the, is the, and how do you do that? Is that the question? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, so, um, so there's a couple of issues. Well, there's a lot of issues. Uh, one is, um, uh, one has to do with the pil piloting your, and we can get as far in the weeds in this as you want, but I'll just headline it. One has to do with the issues concerning piloting your solution with a potential hospital customer. And when I say hospital, it could be one hospital, it could be an integrated delivery network, it could be this huge, it could be United Health Group, so you, or, whatever, or Walmart for that matter. Um, so that's one, is the piloting process. The second is um, the security and all sort of the hoops, the, the, the checklist basically, the validation that you have to go through uh, to get the attention or at least the possibility of working with a hospital. And the main ones have to do with, as you mentioned, electronic health integration um, and cybersecurity and workflow and the work involved. And that mostly has to do with jumping through the IT hurdles. And not the least of which is which problem are you trying to solve? And is this something that's a point solution or is it something that can be used across a platform? 18 hospitals in 14 states versus one hospital or even one department, the department of OBGYN to reduce maternal mortality in one hospital versus an entire system. Um, the second, and then the second issue or the next issue has to do with um, over, overcoming the barriers to data integration and data interoperability, which you alluded to in your question. Now, the landscape of data interoperability is changing day by day by day, and it's it's happening within electronic medical record systems, not the least of which is Epic has, has various platforms now where an Epic system in one hospital system can transfer information to another. There are data blocking regulations that are actually, from what I understand, not terribly well enforced. They're illegal, but they're not terribly well enforced. It's like tell us how much you're gonna charge for a colonoscopy. You're supposed to do that, but a lot of hospitals don't do it, but it's not enforced. Or if they do, it's not accurate data and it's kind of funny business. So having to do it in the regs and actually doing it and having be held accountable and enforce another story. Um, and then the whole issue of data interoperability between and among various health service organizations. So an example is I work with a company that is trying to do data interoperability. They're the plumbing company. They're trying to create the pipelines to exchange the data infrastructure. 
and what they're trying to do and very specifically connect hospital systems that are using various electronic medical record systems. And, you know, like four or five EMRs have 80% of the market share. So we're talking about an oligopoly basically of EMRs. Although there's like 300 different EMR products, most of them are concentrated into the names we're familiar with. And what they're trying to do is connect that data to post-acute care settings, nursing homes, skilled nursing facilities, hospitals at home, rehab centers, et cetera. And that data, and most of those places, that is the post-acute care facilities, do not have a electronic medical record systems. It's amazing. Or ambulatory surgery centers for that matter. Or the systems they do have are not compatible with the mothership. So how do you connect the dots? Well, that, that's a, to me, that is, that is an infra, that is a policy question that is going to be dealt with by, I think, the government. Now, whether you like that or not is up to you, but I just don't see the companies. It's not in their interest to share the data. So they're going to have to be told to do it. And, and, and in some respects, they already are. So it's a big, it's a big issue. And it, it, it also, and the third issue is because of those problems, does a hospital make or buy? Do they just do it themselves? Like we just heard from Anthony, like here's what you need to do to get started and all that other business. And then the question is, well, do we do this ourselves or do we go out and get a vendor to do it? And then you got to deal with vetting vendors and all that other stuff. So it's, it's, a, pretty, it's a pretty complicated ecosystem. And then the final one, as I see, is sales and marketing. It's like, why should I buy your product compared to somebody else's? Oh, man. But when we get like 100 of these over to Transom from, from people that want to sell it to us. Now, I don't know whether that answered the question or not, but I think, to me, the bottom line is if, if you need to really understand the customer, if you're a startup doing this, you have to understand the customer and what is it they want you to do? What is the problem they're asking you to solve? And typically these days, the vast majority of those problems are financial and operational. They're not clinical. I want you to help us make more money and improve our revenue cycle management. I want you to help me find people who are willing and able to stay in the healthcare workforce. I want you to help me uh, uh, do X, Y, Z in terms of an operational function and workflow and, and make doctors more productive. It's really not about clinical decision-making. And if it is clinical decision-making, something like 70 to 80% of the, of the AI applications are for radiology. So that's a big tail in the non-radiology, mostly pattern recognition specialties. So Anthony or anybody else have, I mean, it's a good question. Everybody's facing the same issues, but so who has some answers? I mean, there's a bunch of problems and a bunch of issues, but well, how, do you you do, how, how do you do this? Um, well, if you read the executive order that came out a couple of weeks ago, very carefully, um, I'm very pleased, pleasantly, surprised but very pleased to see that in the executive order there's a strong emphasis on data infrastructure for healthcare uh, AI and so I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised because most of us in healthcare aren't even really thinking that's the most critical part but somehow the White House got enough information to really put emphasis and hopefully some funding behind you know, um, they're very careful about not using the word uh, regulating too much in the executive order, but that's sort of the stick that's going to come a little bit later. I think they're hopefully giving us an opportunity to get this better organized from us rather than from the top down from the government. But I don't think they're going to give us a whole lot of time. So there is a, a sense of urgency about getting the 
the data governance and data structures and data strategy squared away in health systems. Perhaps I'm guessing that if a few hospitals can get this right within the next year or two, then a lot of hospitals will follow. And it's far better to come from us, Arlen, than from the hosp- from the government, because I'm not sure they kind of um, know exactly how to do this, as demonstrated by other sort of uh, top-down approaches to healthcare. Well, the problem is that, at least according to recent surveys, um, doctors, patients, and healthcare executives simply don't trust artificial intelligence. Now, and they don't trust the government or industry to get it right. Now, if you think back to the early days of electronic medical records and the High Tech Act, so what happened? The government said, we're gonna make, we're gonna spend billions on carrots and sticks so that hospitals will get EHR, EMRs, and look where we are. And some would argue that it's done more harm than good. So how to, and to expect that to happen with artificial, with what we're talking about, data interoperability, artificial intelligence, in a year and get it right, I just don't think is possible. So how do we prevent the same thing happening to AI that happened to electronic medical records that, that just are dysfunctional? How, what would you say if you're if you're sitting on the advisory committee in the White House and maybe you are? What what would you tell people? I think Anthony's right that the healthcare has to take charge of this, and and some health system has to get it right so that others will follow, rather than relying on the government, as as we've seen what they did with uh, with the with EMRs and the EHRs. Healthcare's got to take charge of this. Yeah, but what does that mean? Health. I mean, who is healthcare? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're talking. You're, you're talking about the medical industrial complex, which includes doctors and health professionals in in the in the trenches. I, with all due respect, I don't have a whole lot of confidence in my colleagues being activists in this regard. I mean, I, it just seems to me that they're just fed up. And, and, you know, notoriously, doctors are disorganized and aren't active in policy change. So, I, yes, I, I, if we're going to do this, you got to sort of not do something else because we have 24 hours in a day. And if that not something else is income derived, it's going to be a tough ask to say, instead of making money seeing patients, I want you to go to Washington and testify or to your state legislature. I mean, literally a 10 minute drive downtown and testify in front of a committee at your state level. It's pretty hard to get people to do, let alone vote. So this whole issue of doctors participating in policy formulation is a whole other issue, but my view is we're not very good at it. Would you agree? Yeah, I, in the words of Elon Musk, um, you know, even though it's a near impossible task, it's too important not to do. And I think we just have to have to do it. Uh, yeah, well, too much that's yeah. safe, too important not to do. It's easy to say, well, it's nearly impossible. Let's not do it. Right. No one has time for it, but it's just too, the stakes are way too high at this time. Well, it's like that old saying, bankruptcy happens all of a sudden, I mean, gradually, and then all of a sudden. I, I think that winning this revolution, which is really what it is, it's, it's the fifth industrial revolution, and who's going to win? It, it, it's little by little by little, there'll be a straw that breaks the camel's back, and then I think people will get activated. But I think we're sort of in the mid-straw period right now. I, I just don't see that sense of urgency. People are just too busy worrying about other stuff. So I, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer, but I, I just see that as, as the reality. Um, so I, I, mean, I look at it a little bit differently. I, I look at this as an unusually grand opportunity to have impact and influence over something that's going to dictate how medicine will be practiced for the next few decades. 
and we're not going to have an opportunity like this too many times. So I think it's it is time for doctors and nurses and healthcare administrators to band together and say that we should absolutely have a voice in in uh, not so much regulating this, but have impact on how this should be done. So Amit, you have a question about blockchain. You want to ask your question? Yeah, so this is one domain I've been sort of trying to learn about. And we, since we're discussing about data interoperability, we are talking about data security and privacy. So do you folks feel that this blockchain technology that was initially there for this Bitcoin cryptocurrency stuff is going to be something that should be used in healthcare? You see a place for this? Um, Anthony? Arlen? Yeah, I see. Blockchain. Go ahead, Arlen. Did you have an answer too? No, go ahead. I was just going to say blockchain will come in big when we get more and more active in the area of federated and swarm learning, which bypasses having to share raw data. So I think blockchain is going to come back in big as a potential resource that's going to be activated for those kinds of uh, paradigm shifts, but not not right now until we get the federated and the swarm learning more. more um, indoctrinated in our mindset. Yeah, I put a link to a company called Burst IQ uh, in the chat. And this is a block, this is a, a healthcare uh, a blockchain company. Uh, it happens to be in Denver. Um, and um, you, you can sort of go through there. Uh, and of course, human first intelligence driven digital transformation on their website. I mean, that's a mouthful. Of course, you got to, that's all the buzzwords, and, you know, all the stuff you have to say. But um, the, the use cases uh, you can see um, have to do, well, a couple of issues. One is, and I used to, I'm friends with a woman who actually was their director of research, and then she subsequently moved on. PhD, very bright data scientist, that kind of person. Um, so a lot of this has to do with um, a couple of things. One, people, when you say blockchain, people think crypto. They, they don't, and then all the issues with crypto and meltdown, you know, they, they don't get it. It's like, no, I don't want to invest in crypto. But that's not what we're talking about. You know, we're talking about the infrastructure, the process, the blockchain. So that's number one. Number two, um, People are concerned uh, because of that, of the halo effect with the things you mentioned, cybersecurity and fooling around and access and all this other business. Um, but I think the main applications, and then third, there are things now called uh, democratized autonomous organizations, EAOs. And actually I'm, I'm participating and I'll put, the, I'll put that link in here. Uh, and again, I'm not promoting these things. I'm just giving you examples of what people are doing. Um, so Merge Medical is a platform of doctors, by doctors, for doctors, trying to uh, empower them to regain uh, their uh, happiness with this and financial independence. It's a, it's a democratized autonomous organization is set up that way using blockchain, essentially. Um, another use case is, uh, is credentialing, like universal credentialing, is so that you don't have to apply to 50 different states to be a doctor in each of the states. You don't have to go through all the rigmarole when you're applying to one hospital in a hospital system versus another. Um, so it, 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 it seems to be useful in that regard. Second has to do with uh, uh, prior authorizations and uh, again, ultimately revenue cycle management in terms of sending bills and making sure they get to the right place and limited mistakes and reducing prior authorization requests and all that other business. So I do think, I mean, there are already some use cases and applications uh, that are being uh, have, that have already been deployed. Um, I, I think it's going to be a. I mean, it's a. I think it's going to be a reach to get 
the attention of physicians and frontline workers to get their head around blockchain when we still are beating them up with artificial intelligence and trying to get that, as we just discussed. I, I just think it's techno overload and techno fatigue. I mean, we get, it's just too much, there's too much there. So will it eventually happen? I, I think it will, but I think like, you know, like most things that are running in the background, I don't think most people understand how GPS works. I don't think most people understand how artificial intelligence works. I don't think most people understand how blockchain works. As long as it does what it's supposed to do, I, I think most people really don't care. Until something goes wrong. Like Google tells you to make a left instead of a right. And you wind up at a dead end. Or an AI in no multiple. So th th there's just my thoughts. So Anthony, what, do you, what are your thoughts? Or Eric, again, is this like a, this is not something I really care about as the CEO of the hospital? No, I think you're right. There's a disconnect between medical, clinical, and what, who oversees medical, clinical, the CIO, the CEO, the CMO. Operations. Doctors, yeah, and doctors working in the field. I mean, it's it's got to be inherent upon uh, the C-suite to, to to take charge of this and, and to if, if not, you know, designate doctors to, to to do some of this lobbying is to find the right avenue to 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 get into those policy discussions. Um, does it, do health systems represent themselves in Washington as on this at the on the C suite level with this with these arguments over governance? Um, Darn, do we look for a physician champion? Yeah, and I think that uh, the other thing that's on well is here uh, and sticking its nose under the tent is quantum. Hmm. Uh, and that's like the same conversation that we had with or having with general artificial intelligence. Like what's this gonna wind up doing? And, and how is it gonna displace everything else? And it's accelerated the pace of change. So now you have to deal with not just techno fatigue and this this change thing, but the pace has increased. Stuff is changing faster. Product life cycles are shorter. Now, maybe that creates a sense of urgency. I don't know, but but that's what I experience. I mean, every day you read about something new and like, gee, how do we get ahead around this? Um, I think it has, um, Arlen, created a sense of urgency based on my... my uh, trips in the last two or three weeks the invitations are coming harder and faster and more just i wouldn't say desperation but certainly increased sense of urgency about what's happening knowing what's happening and knowing how to get started uh, mm -hmm. from the c-suite and i think i see eric nodding his head he's probably seeing the same thing people no longer can think oh this is a fad that will pass just like everything else and I, I think the C-suites are taking it much more seriously than even a year ago. Mostly, I think, uh, as a result of seeing what these large language models are doing and and surprise how good they are. Uh, and this is only beginning. Um, so wait till five, 10 years from now. Uh, so I, I think people are seeing, I think for the first time in a lot of people, the the potential of something that has to do with AI is is more obvious now to most people than ever before. When we're talking about like, you know, deep learning and medical image interpretation, that's still pretty much of a black box because they, they don't have access to it. And just like desktop computing, when it became more available, I I see the same sort of, you know, renaissance feeling that people have that this, this is a game changer now, so. How much do you think, uh, well, two questions, one is, you know, we're all reading about the so-called doctor shortage and workforce shortage, et cetera, et cetera, and how long it is to get an appointment and all that. Um, how much do you think that, and Anthony, you've been involved and I've been involved in sort of teaching the younger generation. Um, the older generations, like people like me, you know, they're, they're saying, this is ridiculous. I'm out of here. I'm, I just can't deal with this. I don't need to. 
if you don't need to, then, you know, I'm over, I got my pension, whatever, I'm out. So the question is, different generations face this uh, uh, pass, persevere, or punt decision with a different mindset. And so my observation, in part because of Anthony's guidance, is younger folks, and by younger, I mean like early stage career people, they're saying, this is great, you know, look, throw it at me. Like I'll just, I'm taking whatever you can throw at me because I'm going to do this. The older folks are saying, eh, I don't think so. So it's creating a, you know, early retirement, early clinical. So how much of this technology tsunami do you think is responsible for workforce shortages? I, th I think it's going to exaggerate the trends. Um, the senior people are starting to feel like this is the last weight on the balance to tip them over <laughs> to early retirement. More, more than looking at this as an opportunity to perhaps prolong their career, which is how I'm proposing to them that this could prolong your career because it's going to make medicine more interesting. And I, as, as Harvey saw when I was in clinic, I use a large language model almost once in a few times an hour. It makes it makes my practice even more fun and interesting. And I wish more physicians would see it that way. Um, but until we get to that point of mass education, I think people are going to find this more intimidating than something that could be friendly. Uh, on the other hand, you're right about the younger generation. They're now very vocal about making sure that they get this education more than ever before. So um, I think, and and the schools have sort of started to have some um, education in the AI are definitely ahead of the pack. I just turned in a proposal uh, yesterday, Arlen, to have an AI rotation for the residents and fellows at my hospital it was actually unanimously approved. So um, I, I think the time is, is I mean, thanks to large language models, people are playing with it, although only about 10 to 25%, depending on the audience, in healthcare have actually used it themselves. I'm actually giving our C-suite a, a quick introduction in a few weeks. They wanna know everything about AI and large language models. So kudos to them. You know, there are C-suites that are thinking, are very forward thinking like that. They wanna learn about it and learn how to use it at their jobs. So I, I think that's gonna come. And, and I think it's gonna come faster because the technology is exponential. I think that adoption at some point is going to really take off and, and be semi-exponential. It won't be exponential like technology, but the human aspect will make it uh, so yeah. pretty fast. So one of the five pillars that I put up at the very beginning is level up data literacy with specific curricula for pers personas or role families. Um, and that speaks to this issue of you have to educate the whole food chain and by that, I mean, I think it starts in pre-med. I, I mean, it starts actually P through 20, but I can only get my arms around certain stuff because I'm not a P through 20 educator. I'm not an elementary ed educator. I deal with graduate students and med schools and that kind of stuff. So I think the education needs to start in pre-med. And there's a whole conversation about what's that look like engineering, computer science, data literacy, data dexterity, being able to interpret the literature, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. As a preamble, I think it's a whole lot more important these days than organic chemistry and the Krebs cycle. And who knows, maybe computer science is the new doctor killer. Right now it's you know, organic chemistry. But that being said, I think we need to start it earlier. And then we need to figure out how do we educate the food chain. And the food chain is pretty much anybody that works in healthcare. It's not just med students or residents. I mean, you have to upskill the whole workforce. Secondly, you have to upskill the C-suite. And third, you have to upskill the board. So I don't think there's a lot of conversation about educating the board of directors or the board of trustees of a not-for-profit when it comes to artificial intelligence. So how do you do that and, and measure it and improve it, you know, all that. So that gets to, you know, 
just education and training and, and how people in our roles are trying to do that. Some are more successful than others, but uh, ultimately it's going to come down to using AI to personalize AI education for individuals who have, as indicated in what I just said, personas or role families. So depending on your mindset, attitude, and persona, example, like we just said, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread, and I want to learn everything there is to know about it. Two, you got to be kidding. I'm out of here. How do you deal with those people in between and you know all that other stuff? So that's a persona. And then the role family has to do with what is your role at the hospital? You know, are, are you on the board of directors of the hospital? Are you the department chair? Are you the division chief? Are you the grunt in the trenches? I mean, how do we personalize this? I, I just think it's just a heavy lift. We can't do it one off. So we have to use technology and educational technologies to get it done. And I think it will be personalized. It is being personalized using artificial intelligence to monitor people's progress. More importantly, we need to provide people with experience. And, and that gets to the issue of how do we close the gap between the data and the doctor? So we got computer scientists on one end, we got doctors on the other end and health professionals. Enormous gaps between the two. How do we close those gaps to reinforce competencies in artificial intelligence and these various technologies? Bottom line, it's a heavy lift, but it's an enormous opportunity. Anybody have any comments or questions they want to? Ari, you're sort of deep in the weeds in this. So, how are you creating AI driven personalized curricula for different personas and different roles? Yeah, I think at the end of the day, um, I know Olivia just said, you know, we need to have some AI tools to help. Uh, physicians and healthcare providers. And I put it on there that, you know, one of the things I've been doing is just simple stuff like creating f uh, free infographics. Uh, one of them is just a GPT in healthcare and different tools that are out there and how it can be used in healthcare. Um, big thing, I know you guys do a lot of education and I think that's a core to all of this is we all need to learn and increase. We all have great healthcare IQs now because we're either doctors and healthcare, but now we need to increase our AI IQ and the only way of doing that is by being on these kind of talks and getting with other people and learning. I know uh, Dr. Chang has these awesome uh, weekly office hours that he does on Wednesdays. And, you know, that's a great place. Uh, so bottom line is just education and, and learning in this space. Yeah. And if, uh, and I'll just put a shameless plug in. Um, if you're interested in AI entrepreneurship, Healthcare, AI, entrepreneurship. Um, we've created, uh, I put it in the chat, we've created Soap School. So this is an example. So I just give you a, an example of what, what we've done. It's just one of many. Um, we meaning the Society of Physician Entrepreneurs. So my, my, my observation is that medical schools are not teaching this. So we did. So we... <laughs> We created this, it's a not-for-profit organization. It's an educational thing. We put together a course on fundamentals or introduction to healthcare artificial intelligence entrepreneurship. So this is a, a course for people who are interested in creating healthcare artificial intelligence products and services. How do you do that? And it speaks to the previous question of how do you deal with hospitals? How do you sell your product? How do you develop it? How do you overcome barriers to dissemination and invitation? Oh, blah, blah, blah. So if you're interested, you can sign up. And it's actually on a Canvas black uh, uh, learning, uh, learning module. So it's just like you were taking a college course, except it's like they're cheap. It's like free in most instances. We offer it. It's one hour, the second Tuesday of every month. Uh, and we have eight different modules. And we have eight different professors who are subject matter experts in each of the modules, including Anthony, who's going to talk about large language models of rating and all the stuff we just talked about. 
So that's an example of how I think that this education is being decentralized and democratized. You know, wherever there's a gap, somebody's going to fill it in. So in terms of ed tech, this is basically educational technology, entrepreneurship, and healthcare. It's just an example and a model of, of you know, pick a spot and just do it and, and figure it out. And, and so that's, you know, that's how, uh, I think that's how these things are evolving. And we've seen lots, I mean, there's a million free courses on, on the fundamentals and more advanced topics in artificial intelligence. Coursera and MIT and Stanford, I mean, there's like a, a gazillion of them. But specifically in terms of its application to what we're interested in, how do we get started? What do we get done? How do we do it? What's the infrastructure look like? That's what this other course uh, addresses. Uh, any, uh, Olivia, did you have a question or a comment? No, I was just uh, writing into the chat that um, I think it's important that you convince physicians that they are not threatened by AI tools. I'm a radiologist, so I experienced that, you know, this debate, will radiologists exist in five years' time? Um, but still, I think it would be much easier for both those people who actually invent the tools and also those who will use them if we cooperate and if we look at AI tools as assistants, which will make us faster, better, and you know, more working more efficient, but still needing those doctors to validate their results. Yeah. As long as I have you on the line, I just read something about, there was an article about uh, uh, artificial intelligence and radiology and moral injury. I don't know whether you saw that or not, but the basic idea is there's concerns that radiologists are asking, are being asked to do things using AI platforms that just doesn't make them feel good. <laughs> it, it's, it's just not consistent with what they signed up for. That's my, that's my definition of moral injury. So is, is that something that you're experiencing or that you see, or does somebody just make that up? Well, I think it's a, a fun article. I will look out for it. <laughs> so in my hospital, so I'm from Heidelberg, Germany. So yeah. we don't have AI tools implemented in clinical routine yet. Um, there is a lot of research, you know, those brain tumor segmentations and all that stuff. But as for the clinical implementation, you don't see that yet. Unfortunately, not even for, you know, it would even be uh, sufficient to have it as a second help, just to play with right. what can the tool do, and apart from the thing that we do in, in the routine stuff. Yeah, well, the, the new president of the Radiologic Society of North America, you know, which is like one of the largest uh, organizations in the country when it comes to them, it's like thousands of people go to this conference. And his, his keynote speech was really about AI and sort of the things you're talking about. It's going to replace radiology, moral injury, existential threat, people not wanting to go into radiology, losing your job, all that other stuff. So you might want to just Google that or get Harvey to do yeah. it, chat GBD, and if he hasn't already done it, to look at moral injury and radiology. <laughs> but it's, it's an interesting, uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing. Well, anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. I appreciate all your comments and insights, and uh, hopefully we'll see you next month. Thanks a lot, and have a good week.